Welcome to Behind the Play, a video and podcast product of the Hoops crew that explores the lives of Geelong players past and present, as well as the off-field figures that are keeping us Geelong strong, as well as really important figures from throughout the industry that have really valuable insights. I'm joined by one of those amazing people today, Dr. Peter Larkins. Welcome to the show. Nice to be with you, Paul. Thanks for chatting. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're getting to have a little bit of a chat pre-recording there, and it was it was nice to just kind of learn you know a few little th- uh, and kind of loosely touch on a few things that we'll discuss in the show there. Uh, but really looking forward to having the chat, and thank you very much for coming aboard. No, look, um, got a great connection with the Cats from uh, my earliest memories of football, so nice to be able to contribute to something still uh, at this stage in the uh, in the uh, the era that the Cats have been in, which has been pretty good the last decade, to be honest. Yeah, yeah the last couple of years have been pretty decent. Um, and, you know, I still feel like maybe, maybe I've got the blinders on, I don't know, but it still feels like there could be good years ahead, whether they're premiership years, I don't know, but... Um, I still feel like there's there's plenty of room for success over the coming the coming block of years. Well, look, I mean, all all fans are optimistic uh, pre-season as they should yeah, be. There's a bit of that. Uh, as we always say in the industry, no one's lost a game at this stage. So everyone's on top of the ladder and undefeated. But um, you know, one of the things I suppose again, if we just talk about historically, you know, Geelong has defied the odds where it, it's been often as a club thought that it had its best era and thought that some of its better players had, had gone, you know, the Tom Harleys, the Lings, the Bartell, yeah. they've gone on and, you know, Geelong will go through a slump, you know, and it, it, Geelong just had this ability through its incredible development of its its um, next tier of players. And um, so we were always optimistic that they're, they're going to bounce back after 20, you know, 23 was disappointing off the back of 22. Um but again, you know, footy's a strange beast and uh, it, it does make a difference. Uh, you know, every year teams that are supposed to do well don't and then someone comes out and, uh, you know, surprises everyone. But let's be optimistic because we've still got a great squad down at Canadian Park for sure, Paul. Yeah, certainly the last 20 years or so, really, if we kind of go back to even beginning of 2004 and a prelim final there, it's kind of given Cat supporters reason to think that there's always a chance, even if it doesn't quite work out. There's there's kind of always a chance. And to your point, there's been that cycling through of talent as as the older guard retire and then and the new group step up. It yeah. just seems like uh, I, no, I don't want to get too carried away. I'll jinx I'll jinx it or something like that. But just, yeah. it just feels like success is always attainable. I guess in any given year at the moment. Yeah, look, we you know we'd be careful not to be blinkers on when we're doing a Geelong yeah. show and we're talking about Geelong. But, you know, <laughs> his history would support you know that Geelong has has a way of overcoming the slump that's traditionally been there. And, you know, if you look, as I said, historically, again, not missing out on finals um, is something that, um, you know, we, we we don't want to be looking at. So um, the, the concept of how often we've been able to make finals and then do okay and, you know, prelims and things, and at least you're competitive, which is great, you know, for the exposure for the club and for recruiting and sponsorship and things like that. And, and you're always a chance. I mean, footy, we've seen that. You know, we've seen that with the Bulldogs in 16 when they came yeah. from, you know, Back of the, the pack and, and fell, fell through into the grand final. And, you know, had, so again, you know, you've got to be competitive. And um, again, without getting too medical straight up front early in the, in the, in the pack, <laughs> well, you know, you've got to have your best list available because everyone's got a great list on paper when no one's injured and everyone's come off their pre-season rest or their pre-season or end of season surgery from 23 and gone into 24. But if you look at the way that you know the seasons unfold, the teams that do well, the teams that keep their best. You know, twenty six or twenty eight playing. Um, you, you never Absolutely. get your best two playing the whole time, but but once you're digging down into your 37, 38, 39th player on the list, so the secret, of course, is to stay healthy, uh, and that's all part of the management, uh, both on the coaching staff and, and the sports science and the sports medicine team. Um, you know, that's uh, that's the secret of any club is have your best available. Yeah, um, and I mean, it's going to be a really interesting thing. And and to your point, yeah, keeping everyone fit is is hugely important. And we see, unfortunately, we're hearing stories from other clubs of players that have already had some season-ending injuries early on, or or very significant ones. When I think about, say, a Jake Boydering, for example, at Carlton in recent recent days, as of when we record this, a bit of a vacuum for everyone watching it. But um, it's yeah, yeah it, it can happen very fast. Um, so yeah. so hopefully, and, yeah, and hopefully that's things true. stay good. Yeah, and you look at McStay at Collingwood coming off, you know, the, yeah. the, the troubles he had in 23 and they go on and win a flag and then he does an ACL just, you know, in relatively recent weeks. And Barty Smith, the same, and the Bulldogs, who almost was looking at getting to the Cats at one stage. Yeah. You know, ACL injuries where, you know, you think you're going to have really signature players like that available and then suddenly they're not available for an entire season. And so 
the setbacks that clubs have got to deal with over the, the coming month as we lead into round one even, you know, and is, is going to be um, important because um, you always expect you're going to have your, your best team to start with and that's not often the case. Absolutely. Now, we've obviously spent a bit of time so far talking about present day and and uh, I guess some yeah. of the present day fortunes of the various different clubs, but before we will inevitably find our way back there, but I guess skipping back a little bit, for you, when did footy first come into your life and we know it, you know there's a lot of documentation around the things that you've done in the footy realm but i guess just that pure consumer side of the game was it was it kind of instantaneous Look, did it take a while i can't remember when it wasn't in my life and i know that sounds a bit silly but you know I, I grew up in a little rural property outside geelong and you know from the age of four or five i was aware of the footy club and 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 you know my uncle was one of the head trainers at geelong so you know, as a as an eight or nine year old, I was down in the club rooms at Geelong, learning how to strap an ankle. And you know, in those days, it was pretty primitive medical care in terms of yeah. what went on. You know, it was liniment and oranges, and you know, strapping up and a few massage people. But but you a know, pat my on the dad, back and out you go. <laughs> yeah, you know, it would, it, the smelling salts were there if you got knocked out. But um, the thing was that you know, footy in Geelong was sort of something that you you really were, were aware of, whether you were um you know, sort of uh, in town or a bit out of town like we were. So, again, at, you know, five or six years of age, I knew about Geelong Footy Club. And and as I said, because of my Uncle Pat, Pat Whelan, as, um, I got to go down to the footy club, you know, as a eight-year-old and, and certainly got the the sense of the atmosphere in the rooms. And, um, you know, I had no idea that I'd be have a footy connection for that long. It was pretty clear that Geelong was going to be the team that I followed. My dad was very good friends with Frank Costa, who, um, of course, was so so prominent in Geelong as the mayor and then ultimately as the president of the footy club. And so I, I got to go to the footy a little bit, you know, in my early teenage years, yep. 12, 13, 14. Um, and so the, the concept of, you know, having the, the footy connection was there. And the doctor who was one of the main doctors for the Geelong Footy Club, Kevin Threlfall, who came president of the club ultimately, was also our family doctor. So when I got hurt playing footy at, at school or hurt with my running from my own activities, which fortunately wasn't too often, Paul, um, the doctor that I went to was the Geelong Footy Club doctor, which I thought was a pretty cool job to have, of course. Absolutely. Um, and so once I got into the medical um, course, um, I sort of kept in touch with Kevin and had an opportunity to get a little bit of experience behind the scenes footy even before I became a doctor. Was there, I guess, in those really early days, and obviously there was such a Geelong presence around you, were there any voices in the year trying to tempt you to, I guess, throw your support behind another club, whether it was a family member or anything? Was it, was it Geelong all the way? Uh, no, there was never much influence. I mean, I had one or two strays in our family, black sheep, who, who um, one supported North Melbourne. So I said they obviously had read the direction of the stripes incorrectly <laughs> because they got the hoops connected wrong. And um, my niece, um, who started following um, Collingwood because Renee Kink, number 36, was running around as the Incredible Hulk and, I, and she was just a you know, 13, 14 year old who was I think besotted by the fact that he was such a good looking dude uh, Renee, so so there wasn't many strays in our family away from the, the blue and white to, to follow um, in that direction, so no, no pressure on me and uh, it would have taken a lot I suppose to have changed it anyway Now so many people know about your your history within, within football, but I think a uh, something that maybe gets overlooked a little bit by people from time to time is the extensive background in steeplechase in particular, um, the athletic background there. So, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I guess let's, let's kind of wade into that a little bit. And I guess, when did that really, I guess, fall on your radar because you've won steeplechase over many, many years in national, in national competitions. So um, how did that, I guess, become a, a viable option for you? And I guess, where did the interest first begin? Well, I was very fortunate growing up in Geelong because it, we've just talked about it. It's a very sports city, not not just based around and footy or VFL. It was at the time when I was at school, and I went to um, St Joey's CBC, yep. which historically has been a very strong school academically as well as from a sport point of view. And, and we boast as a school more AFL senior players now than any other school in Australia. So, whether you're going back to you know, to the McMaster time or then the Barry, you know, Barry Stonehams and, you know, right through to the Cameron Ling, Jimmy Bartell and, you know, we, we've had yeah, so, scarlet. so so it was a great footy school. But it also I had a, um, a brother who was very good at athletics and, and my dad was involved at Landy Field, which was the running track down at Geelong as well. And in fact, we knew John Landy as a family friend. And so I had a real 
uh, interest in running and and my choice of sports at, at school was so extreme. So I played cricket, athletics and footy as my main sports as a schoolboy and was fortunate enough to play, you know, right through the first 18 at school and we went under 12, under 15 footy. But athletics was also probably the sport that I was best at and, and was winning, you know, the school um, athletics trophies. And by the age of four to 15, I'd already been selected in the under 17 Victorian team as a, as a distance runner over 800 metres. So I started off over 800 metres. But the reason I got into steeplechasing, for those listeners who may not appreciate, I wasn't a jockey riding the horses. Steeplechase is a running event, um, a distance running event at senior level, 3,000 metres at least. Um, where you're jumping over the barriers and the water jump, pretty famous. It's the hardest event on the running program. I always say to people, Paul, it's you know you've got to be the you've got to be able to jump and run and sprint and all those sort of things. But lots of disciplines involved. Yeah, and and the reason that I was able to get in, so as a middle distance runner, I transferred easily into the steeplechasing where there was jumping because um, down at Landy Field, my coach Rudy Hockrider was quite famous in Geelong as an athletics coach, and he really got us to do everything, including hurdles and sprints, as yep. part of our athletic training. So. Hurdling came naturally to me at school. In fact, I competed in state championships as a 12 and 14 and 15 year old as a hurdler. And so the steeplechase, which does involve jumping over barriers, came pretty naturally to me. And my middle distance running was better than as I got a bit older. You know, I became a bit slow over 800 and I became the 1500 metre and then the steeplechase at 3000. So, so in this pathway of footy versus athletics, athletics was something that I was sort of getting a bit more um, enjoyment out of and success at. So I went into that direction. And as you said, I, I was lucky enough to have 10 years at the international level um, and between junior and senior um, championships, I think 11 Australian titles over steeplechase event, as well as some over 15 and 800 metres. So so the athletics background was pretty strong, but sport background was pretty strong. So it really gave me my interest in, in the medical side of sport all the way through because I'd really been a consumer in the sense that I'd been an athlete. Yeah. So when looking at things I wanted to do. I was always interested in high performance, so whether it was nutrition and training and recovery and equipment. So the whole concept of what made sports successful was something that I grew up with really as a, as a 9, 10, 11 year old. So it was pretty easy to transfer that into the into the sports medicine direction when I got into study time. And we should absolutely acknowledge also the the Olympic and Commonwealth Games appearance as well, which, you know, it's no mean yeah. feat to be able to participate in that. So yeah. I mean, a massive yeah. congratulations for that too. Uh, thank you. Look, it was not something you, you, I mean, you have to set targets, of course, but it's not something as a 12 year old, you know, I never was running around a 12 year old at Landy Field saying I'm going to run in the Olympics at some stage. It, it really just hit me between the eyes when I was about 17 or 18. And my coach, when I transferred to, to study in Melbourne at 17, I was at university and, and I transferred from running in Geelong to running for um, initially Melbourne University Club, but then Box Hill. And the coach there said, you know, look, we could have the Olympics was two years away. And he said, you know, we could have you at the Olympics. And I thought he was dreaming, I, you know, it, but basically just with hard work and, and training and, you know, picking an event where it was um, something I was really cut out to do with my distance running yeah. at a bit of speed. So ultimately, um, yeah, I was very, very fortunate, you know, to, to within a year of sort of putting my head down as a, as a 19 year old by 20 and 21, I was already at international level. And how do you reflect on some of those, especially you know the the big the big marquee things like the Olympics? I guess what were some of those experiences like? Because very few, regardless of what sport they might be involved in, very few will make it to that level. So, I guess how yeah. do you reflect upon that period? What was the experience even like in the first place? A bit of a whirlwind at the time. Yeah, look, it is. It's a long time ago, Paul. That's the first thing I'll say. But look, it it, it it's an extraordinary experience. I mean, you, you look back and say, wow, did I really even do that? And and um, you know, of course, at the time, and without wanting to date myself too much, we're not we're not talking about recent Olympics. We're talking about Olympics when there really wasn't all the infrastructure to support um, finance. You know, amateur yeah. athletes. It was amateur athletics at the time. You know, and. Um, and, and so the, the concept of having to train and then get yourself overseas to prepare if you wanted to prepare, but then the way the Olympics ran in those days that you had to be in Australia in the month or two before the Olympics and everyone travelled in the same plane. I mean, the first time I went to Olympics was Montreal 1976, just to put some, some historic dates on it. Yeah. We went on a charter flight, you know, out of Melbourne. It was eight degrees in Melbourne in the middle of winter in July and we flew all, all night and ended up in Montreal. It was 34 degrees and stinking hot. There was no pre-season if you like so we didn't yeah. get to do what the current athletes do so i look back at it and i thought gee how primitive it was because we were really coming in our off season and turning up to play in a grand final without a practice match so to speak in footy terms right <laughs> um and so it wasn't a great experience i mean you know 
in terms of the way we prepared, whereas it's totally different now for our athletes in the last, um, you know, sort of 20 years or so where they get to spend time in Europe, whether they're the hockey team or the rowing team or the swimmers, and so they prepare really well. But to answer your question, it was just an amazing experience because here you are with the best of the best in the world. You, you're, you're living in an Olympic village and you've got a world champion over there and a world record holder over there and, and you're watching other sports at the absolute best being played. And, and so whilst I didn't come away with, you know, a lot of um, gold or gold or silver medals out of the Commonwealth or Olympic Games, I came away with incredible experience, incredible knowledge of the sport and an understanding of the way other countries were working, I suppose, in terms yes. of the way they had support around their athletes, the way they prepared. So in terms of my future goals or future connections, that that experience was invaluable for me because I really lived the experience as an, an, an international performer. And so I knew the demands that athletes needed to do to get things right. So when I went into the sports medicine world, I was able to put myself in the shoes of the patients that I treated, initially the elite people, but these days it's just everyone that I look after who are just people trying to stay fit and stay active. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the experience of, of mixing, you know, with the Sebastian Coes of the world and, and, and the Steve Ovets and the John Walkers, and the, these are the guys that had the world records over 800 metres, 1,500 metres. And I got to compete on what's called the, the Grand Prix circuit. So the Grand Prix circuit is each, you know, August and September, October in, in, in Europe where you get to compete in the best meetings every year. So whether it was Zurich or Dusseldorf or London and Rome and, and um, Helsinki. So as an Australian champion, you sort of almost got a wild card entry into those events. Um, nice. Yeah. And, and so I was really on that circuit for, which was pretty tough on the studies because I was disappearing from university for six weeks or so every, um, every August and coming back at the end of September. But to me, it was part of a unique experience to improve myself. You had to compete overseas because there really wasn't enough competition in Australia for me. So, And it allowed me to travel at a time when sports medicine was developing pretty strongly in those countries. And at that time, you know, that, that time I was competing, Paul, I was able to go to East Germany. I was able to go to Russia, Romania, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria. So... It was at a time when it was quite restricted, but as an athlete, you got to go and compete in some of those places. So I had a real sense of what was going on in the in the medical support system, some of which was dodgy, as we've obviously found out when we look back at the doping and the drug scene. Particularly. Well, yeah. And so I had a great insight into what was going on as a medical student. My head used to fall off when I would be watching and hearing about what some of these athletes were taking and doing. But in those days, the, of course, the anti-doping system was very, very primitive. And so... I was pretty frustrated that the people out there were getting away with as much as they did. And historically, we've seen that, particularly, say, Russia and East Germany and um, and that side of things. So it gave me a great insight into sports medicine, the good and the bad. Um, and it really motivated me to want to be working in that field because I thought, well, why wouldn't we have a great sports medicine culture in Australia going forward when we look at all the sport we've got, whether it's cricket or whether it's tennis or whether it's footy, you know, whether it's rowing or hockey, you name it, we're a sporting nation but we didn't have a really strong sports medicine discipline or specialty in that field of medicine. So that was something I just set my sights on heading into that field as a result of my yeah. experience as an athlete. And so I guess how, how was that period of study though? And obviously, as you say, kind of interrupted from time to time with different meets and events that you'd be, that you'd be competing in, but um, the experience of studying, uh, learning about, uh, learning about the craft. And I guess being able to draw upon those experiences and things that you witness, both good and bad, uh, I guess, how did that kind of inform that whole block of study that you would have uh, completed? Well, it gave me the opportunity to develop some network of people. So when I did um, have opportunity as a medical student to do what's called elective, um, where you get, get, get time to go away and perhaps do some studies overseas, I was able to make connections with some of the doctors I'd met who were the Olympic doctors, particularly in Canada and in the UK and in the US. And so I was able to sort of, you know, make a connection, say, hey, can I, can I come and spend a month, you know, under your wing and, and sort of, you know, shadow you around. And, and so those opportunities were, were came, including going to East Germany, I might say, at one stage as well, before the Berlin Wall came down. So that was, you know, it was almost impossible to get into East Germany as a, as a Westerner. But I had a good connection with the Australian doctor here who had been friends with the East German doctor. So there was one little special period of Got time that I in. even got to do that. So... So there was all just little pieces of, you know, time here, time there. There was no one place you could go and spend a year. I did that later on after I graduated from medicine because, again, there was no 
postgraduate course in Australia in that specialty of sports medicine as there is now for, for young doctors who are coming through and want to specialise in, in sports medicine. They can do that in Australia. But at the time, I had to go overseas. But I was fortunate enough at the end of my medical school days, um, graduation, once I'd finished the hospital time to win a Sir Robert Menzies fellowship. And Sir Robert Menzies, our ex-Prime Minister, was, was a great fan of sport. And so his family trust had set up a scholarship, one in for law and one in medicine. Um, and I was able to snag one of those, which gave me a chance to, to go away for a year and really pick the eyes out of some of those places I was saying to you about. It gave me the opportunity to come back with a little bit more knowledge than I would have gained by spending time in Australia. Yeah, and obviously a huge honour as well along the way. Um, yeah, well, again, it was, um, you know, there were, I was fortunate to get two scholarships, Hume Turnbull Fellowship and then Sir Robert Menzies, and that just allowed me to... To, to get away um, and um, you know it, it's then I came back here with really the intention of, of trying and right at the time the sports medicine was really just starting to roll along the Institute of Sport hadn't even started when I when I first came back from those those studies but I got involved with them right at the beginning um, and so historically we'd had a little bit of a sports medicine culture in Australia since the 56 Olympics and so there had been an organization set up and so I joined them as a, as a student member uh, but it really wasn't until the Institute of Sports started, you know, in the early 80s that we really started to really probably support our athletes properly at the elite level. Even footy clubs in those days, just to bring the footy flavour back in again, Paul, they really just had part-time GP doctors who, were, yep. you know, had to practice at Geelong or they practice in Melbourne or Carlton and they'd look after the club on the weekend. But they were was voluntary. There were always the trainers who were voluntary. You might have had a physio or two. So the, the structure and support around an AFL club now is doesn't resemble anything like it did when I first started working at Geelong, helping Kevin Threlfall as an assistant doctor in the 1980s, because that was my first footy club that I worked at was was Geelong, yep. and and so the whole concept of the way sports medicine, sports science, the nutrition, the strength and conditioning, the psychology, the recovery, obviously the injury management, that whole it's thing is exponentially has, different. Well, in Australia, it's developed. You know, we are looked upon as one of the nations that does that the best, and whether you know, and a lot of people do want to come out here and study our systems now. So we do a great job, not just with footy, but you know, whether it's our tennis players or whether it's our hockey team or whether it's our Matildas um, girls, you know, in in the women's um, world soccer team or whether you know any of our teams, we have elite medical and science care behind our elite athletes. Yeah, and I mean, as you say, that kind of takes time. It was it was a far more primitive state not that long ago when we look at it in the grand scheme of things. But the as I kind of said, yeah. there, that exponential rise and increase of what we've seen over the last few decades alone um, has positioned the the country exceptionally well. Yeah, look, as I said, you, you can go back to the Institute of Sport, and you know, which is the '80s. Just for those listeners who aren't familiar with that, when the Institute of Sport opened up. Um, but in terms of footy, again, just to be specific on that, I mean, I, I had the chance to work at Geelong for six years as an assistant doctor to the club doctors down there. And then I got um, a tap on the shoulder when Adelaide uh, Crows came into the competition. And they, they began in 1990. And I knew the, the Olympic swimming doctor, Brian Sando, and he was um, the doctor for the Adelaide Crows because he'd been a sandful footy doctor as well as his work with Olympics, Paul, over there. Yes. Uh, they needed someone in Victoria who knew the Victorian scene, you know, where the hospitals were and where the specialists were, and if a player had to stay behind because they had broken ribs. So Brian asked me if I'd help out with the Crows. So I had another seven years working down on the on the benches, you know, so to speak, on the sidelines in the footy. Years. So I did six years Geelong, seven years at the Crows. And it was during that time at the Crows that I reckon, which was they came in in 1990 and they won their first flag in 97, um, that, that that's when really I think the sports science started to really come in a lot more and the medical support got a lot better and people get paid a little bit, you know, but it's totally different in 2024 than it was back then even. Oh. Magnitudes. Magnitude. Uh, you obviously you obviously just highlighted there yeah, the different experiences of the two, two different clubs. Now, as a Geelong supporter along the way, um, you obviously got to see and be witness to work alongside some legends of the club there you know, on the playing side and off field as well. Similar sort of story for the Crows, some wonderful players and people that went through the Crows there as well. Uh, what were some of those experiences like along the way working with with both different clubs and obviously one of them being a club that you'd supported from a very young age? Yeah, yeah. well, it was pretty exciting. I mean, Gary Ablett Sr. was playing when I went down to, to work. He'd come across from, from Hawthorne, of course, and he was really just starting. So I started at Geelong helping Kevin Threlfall in 1984. 
And um, so, you know, Gary Ablett was starting to be the star right through the 80s, right up to his magnificent 89 grand final, which we don't talk about the result, but the fact that no. he was, you know, he, he did so well on the day with his, uh, his performance against the Hawks that in that the, the best grand final of all time. So, so you know, but yeah, there were so many good players down at Geelong at that time. And, and, and um, you know, I had um, John Devine was coaching at one stage, and then Tommy Hafey, who was an interesting yep. cat to work with, uh, no pun intended, because... <laughs> He was a different fellow. He didn't, he didn't believe in doctors. You know, if you broke your leg, you just got up there, son, and went back out there. And I remember when Mickey Turner, who um, did his ACL, and um, he came back from um, an ACL injury, and, and Tommy didn't believe that there was such thing as an, the ACLs. You know, it's only a little ligament. What, it can't be important in a knee. You know, how can it break and, down the whole person? Yeah, what are you yeah, talking about? How can a soccer player playing footy with such a tiny little ligament? You, go, you know, your doctors are all making it up. So, um, you know, it was an interesting time there. But, um, again, and the Crows were quite different because the Crows were pretty much a state side when you think about it, when they came yep. in. Um, you know, they had the Charmins and they had Modra and, they, you know, they had the Rusciutos. I mean, it was a, seriously like a South Australian state side. And because they were funded so well, their rooms, their gym, their training facilities were the best I'd ever seen by any club across all the clubs at that stage. Um, but then everyone wanted to copy them, you know, and um, so that sort of grew and grew and grew through the 90s into the 2000s where the support around came through. But, yeah, look, it's just, I mean, you just admire athletes. I mean, I've been lucky to work with athletes across a whole range of sports. So when you say what was it like, you just sit back and watch these guys play footy at a level that I was never going to play at. But, um, and, you know, and, and sort of trying to help them understand that, you know, preparing for a sport, you've got a whole lot of things you've got to get right. It's not just the training on the footy track. It's the recovery. It's the sleep. It's the nutrition. And I think all that yeah, started. My background in Olympic sports had taught me that long before I sort of got into the footy world. And the footy world adopted that afterwards because I think individual athletes like track and field and swimmers have already already had that mindset for for a long time. But footy really came into that probably in the late nineties and two thousands, and um, much more sophisticated now with the, the the support staff that's behind a footy team these days. As I said before, no, that make, makes a lot of sense. And so I guess we we discussed these experiences at the at the Cats, at the Crows, the different facilities, those sorts of things, and we're starting to kind of creep towards the the media era yeah um and so how did how did that first emerge we we kind of spoke about yeah. before we started recording some of the uh, i guess the stepping in with with triple m and and then obviously there was channel yeah, nine and, and a range of different experiences since but how did that first kick off well it, it kicked off when i first came back from those travels overseas in the in when i won those fellowships and, and i came back and i again joined the committee of the um victorian sports medicine um federation as it was called and, and because I'd been overseas and was pretty contemporary with what was happening around the world, they sort of made me the media spokesperson whenever there was a big story uh, in Push the, you the out media. There. I'd comment on, yeah, because, you know, I came back and I was the youngest guy by so far on those committees that all the old guys, and, you know, and I was pretty much a full-time sports medicine person. I was up to date with all the doping code, um, you know, some of the latest treatments overseas. And so when... When there was a big injury, regardless of the sport, whether it was a knee injury in a, in, a, in a footballer or whether it was a head injury in boxing, I got trotted out both by the AMA, the Australian Medical Association, and Sports Medicine Australia. And so the journalists sort of got to know me as the guy to go to when you wanted to make a comment or have some translation done about, you know, what was this drug that the cyclists were using in the Tour yep. de France I'd never heard of. So I was able to at least, if you look back in that time, long before the AFL Triple M stuff, I was sort of doing that on a piecemeal basis. And one of the young journalists that used me quite a bit at that time was an up-and-coming bloke called Eddie Maguire. You've probably never heard of him, Paul, but there's this no, bloke called... No idea. Maguire. What do you do and for Geelong? Yeah, and Eddie was a great <laughs> fan of athletics, so he knew my athletics background. He was a great, great fan of athletics, and he knew my background at, at elite sport, um, Olympic-wise. And he'd seen me, you know, and I'd, he'd done a few interviews. So I... Um, historically, Triple M got its contract in 1996 to broadcast radio games on the FM network. Never been done before, right? Yeah. And I got I got a call from Eddie McGuire and he said, if you sign with the Crows, this was in 96, and I said, no, not yet. He says, don't sign, don't sign. We're going to broadcast footy. So what Eddie was doing was handpicking a, a team of people. So it had Sam Newman and had Steve Quartermain, Jason Dunstall um, doing it. But... He had six or seven people he wanted, and what he wanted my role to be was to be down on the sidelines telling the fans at home, you know, when Paul James limps off the field holding his knee, you know, what's the injury? How long is he going to be out for? And so it was that instantaneous information that the fans... So Eddie, Eddie knew that I'd worked Geelong six years, Crows seven years. He knew I knew 
footy injuries, but he also knew that I wasn't scared of a microphone because of that other stuff I'd done. So, so I swapped across at the beginning of 97 um, to do Triple M work. And prior to that, again, just backing up a year or two, Paul, the footy show had begun in 1994 on Channel 9, the Thursday night footy show. And then I'd done one or two segments a year there. Again, just the, it was a big story. I think, you know, Jason Dunstall did his knee out at Waverley in, in one of the games. And, and so I had to come in and explain what an ACL was, you know, again. So, so I had a little connection with Channel 9 footy show, but the Triple M thing really became... That, that stepped up from, you know, being working with the Crows on the games that they played in Victoria to suddenly I'm doing a Friday night game and then I'm doing a Saturday game and a Saturday night game and a Sunday game. And then I got a call in the second year from Steve Perkin on the Sunday footy show because he used to, at the end of each weekend, I used to do a little roundup on Triple M of what the key injuries were, like who yes. dislocated the shoulder and who'd broken their ankle and who'd done a hamstring. Oh, I recall some of them, yeah. And so I was sort of like, I used to pick the six or eight key injuries, if you like, of the weekend. And I do a little summary of what happened this weekend on the radio. And it was after the Sunday game on on um, the Triple M Sunday game that we did. And um, Steve was driving home in his car and he'd listened to it for a few months in a row. And then he rang me one Sunday night and said, you know what you did this, you know, just did. And he said, what, can you come in next Sunday morning and do that on the Sunday footy show? And I said, do what? He says, just do that little summary. Um, so I turned up there the following week at Channel 9, the studios, and they had this little desk set up in the corner. They had a skeleton behind me. They had a stethoscope around it. And um, it, uh, Max Walker was the host of the footy show. Max, um, uh, Lou Richards was on it, of course. Sam Newman was on it. Mark Jackson was there that day. Mel Brown was over to it. And I'm, and I'm saying, well, what do I do? He says, oh, when the camera goes on, just do what you did. So I had no training, no support whatsoever. They just went to the, the injury segment and I'd memorised the injuries of that. So that was the start of my broadcast of the Sunday footy show. And that went on for the next Thrown six, seven. Deep end. Yeah, yeah. So I was doing the Triple M, then I did the, the Channel 9, and then ultimately there was, um, you know, it sort of moved. Then I started writing the Herald Sun, asked me to write a column, the injury of the week. So each Monday you'd pick up the paper and you could read about who'd had a the ankle injury or the hamstring. So I did that sort of each week. So it just sort of expanded um, between that beginning with Triple M and then Channel 9 connection. And it took me into the, the you know, the web was starting to appear. So AFL.com was coming along. And so I started to do a little segment with them. And it was just, it just, you know, the, the media coverage of footy in the time from when I started in that first six or seven years, it just was the explosion time for coverage. Um, um, so Triple M was there, and obviously ABC and 3AW doing it. Channel Nine had it. Um, Channel, sorry, Channel Seven had the the broadcasting, but Channel Nine yes. had the footy show on the Thursday and the Sunday footy show, which was had a really strong following. So I got pretty well known as the the guy that would be, you know, the doc who would be doing the footy injury stuff, and it was just great. It was just a unique opportunity. I mean, here I was, a guy love footy, love love sports medicine. Um, got to work beside Sam Newman, you know, as I said. Steve Quartermain, Rex Hunt, um, Jason, you know, all the guys, Danny Frawley, you know, all those guys that I worked with over many, many years across the networks and, uh, Icons you know, and I, of the, of the media side. Well, I mean, they were, they were the giants at the time and, you know, and, and, um, and still are in terms of historically what they did. So the media coverage, I think of footy, we talked before Paulie, but you and I about, you know, brought uh, podcasts and YouTubes and, you know, but in those days, they didn't exist that either. Now there's shows, you know, you've got so many shows on TV apart from the footy show, which is gone. But, you know, you had Channel 7 doing game day and then you've got the front bar and you had AFL 360 because once streaming came along with Fox Sports, again, it, suddenly you had footy channels, Fox footy, yeah. you know. My goodness, I worked with them at one stage, you know. So so the opportunity for people to get information and and one of the critical things and you and i spoke about it before one of the things that determines success is having your best team available so my ability i suppose to you know guess and i wasn't guessing because i'd come off a pretty strong 20-year history of being a specialist in sports medicine so i knew the difference between a dislocated shoulder and a broken collarbone i knew yeah. what a mild ankle injury was and a bad ankle injury so i guess my ability to predict in in rough terms the amount of time a player was going to miss became critical for a whole it's lot of people. It's a really valuable resource for these networks. Well, yeah, I mean, it, you know, I mean, I know the opposition clubs used to tune into my medical report because if, you know, if, uh, if you know, uh, Nick Rewalt had hurt his knee in a game, you know, that weekend and the team in Carlton was playing, you know, St Kilda the next week, Carlton guys would be listening to what I'd say about Nick Rewalt because they'd want to be, they'd report back to the coach Absolutely. as to whether 
know, and often the clubs, and they still must the same, I've got to say, Paul, the clubs like to cloud the truth a little bit when they're giving out an injury. Look, uh, we have to wait for the scan or we're unsure what the injury is or we're optimistic he's, only got, he's not going to miss too much time and then you find the guy misses three months, right? So I, I didn't have to have that filter on when I gave out information to people because I wasn't... Um, I wasn't behaving to any club. My, my job was to keep the public educated. I was getting paid by Channel, Triple M or Channel 9 to give information that no one else could give, particularly live during the game. And so there was a lot of pressure on to get it right. Um, but equally, you know, I, I generally found that, you know, most clubs were not wanting to tell the truth very often about their injuries for obvious reasons because yeah. they, they don't want the position to know or they don't want fans to know. But um, and, and to this day, that still happens a little bit. And... Um, it, well, it's it's one of those things, and actually, you'd be curious to kind of pick your brain a little bit about it. I think about the 2023 season, and I think about Geelong specifically. Now, this is a one-eyed platform, but the short-term, medium-term, long-term, and really trying to obscure the the number yeah. of you know, yeah. potentially number of weeks. And of course, as you say, there was always still some intent to try and hide things a little bit back there. But this was kind of a, I felt like a yeah. next level. Um, what did you yeah. what did you kind of make of that? Certainly, as a as a consumer, and someone who doesn't have the knowledge you do, it was it did make things a lot harder to try and get a, a yeah. look in. New, new terminology came on, and, and I think the AFL has already um, squashed it. Addressed that, yeah, yeah. Let me say that. Addressed that because it's so vague. It's a way of clubs not having to to really give out information if they know someone's got a stress fracture and the, in their mid foot, and then they're, they're going to miss you know depending on which bone it is, they're going to miss six, eight, ten weeks. The club's going to say it's short to medium term. Now, what does that mean? Well, medium term, that can be half a season, right? It's, it, you know, well, I think about up. Cam Guthrie kind of fit that bill over the course of the year yeah. where he kind of fluctuated yeah. from short to medium. Now, his circumstances did change at one point. But to be fair to clubs, I mean, sometimes it's very hard to predict when an injury is unfolding how long it's going to take. And on the day yeah. itself, there's enormous pressure on the, the you know, the um, doctors to try and tell the coach whether the players, First of all, he's going to be able to come back that the second half of the game if he's got a you know a tight hamstring or a bit of a, a dodgy shoulder. But when they do get an injury, as to how quickly they're going to recover, because different players recover at different times. So I have some sympathy for for the clubs being a little bit vague with their predictions. But you know, there's a certain pattern to these footy injuries. There's only so many footy injuries that can occur. You know, I've seen them all in 30 years, Paul. So there's there's a there's a time frame that's pretty consistent with those injuries. So I was able to be a bit more precise, much more so than the clubs. Um, you know, and because you know the, the clubs would say that someone's going to miss two to three weeks, and I'd say it's four to six. And when it turned out to be six or seven. You know, people would say, oh, how did you know better than the club doctor? And I said, well, the club doctor did know, but he wasn't allowed to say. Yeah. You know, so, and, and but now they're not putting weeks. They're putting these vague, you know, t periods of time. And and I think in terms of, um, and I don't think it's it, it should be geared around the gambling or the betting agencies or the super coach teams, but people get really upset because I know all the super coach people used to follow my predictions because if they've got they're trying to trade players in hey, there you go. Well, you know, yeah, you know, absolutely in that boat. so if a club says that um dusty martin's got a tired hamstring and then i say he's going to miss six well people are going well who's right you know is 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 doc larkin six weeks am i going to trade dusty martin out now because he's not available or, or are i going to wait and see what the club says um you know so that, that sort of um but that shouldn't be the what what the information's for it should be just a no, nice should, thing. that shouldn't be what's driving it that is absolutely like a meta spin-off of these things whether it is gambling whether it is uh yeah but a lot of it is gambling you know because you know people are betting on you know the next four weeks ahead of time at the games or, or whatever so to know that the that the ruckman's not going to be available to know that a tom hawkins is going to miss a month or the cameron's out with two broken ribs after um you know gary rowan's you know, knock him, him into, knock him into the next suburb in that collision. It, it, <laughs> it was a famous game, you know, when he, when he nearly, nearly knocked out, well, he, he did knock him out. So well, I some, guess, you know, some of the still frames, the way Jeremy's face just got warped in that collision yeah, was yeah, something yeah. standard. So, so that predictability of how much time is going to miss, a lot of it's geared towards the gambling and the betting, as, plus, you know, super coach and teams and all that sort of thing. And I understand that. Um, but it's just the fans themselves, they want to know too, you know, and... Um, Sometimes the players want to know. They want more specific information from the from the club itself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because some I, I remember Shane Crawford just to, not to talk about too many specific injuries. I don't want to, but Shane Crawford, obviously famous Hawthorne player, Brownlow medalist. Yep. 
he did one of those famous syndesmosis, that funny ankle injury where you get a particular ligament in the centre. And, you know, I get accused of making up names, you know, for things. But these are all medical terms that I try to translate into everyday language, Paul, for people. But but I wrote a story about Shane Crawford and his syndesmosis injury in the Herald Sun. And I had a diagram of where the ligament was and I talked about how long it takes to get better. And I ran into Shane literally a few days later because we shared some mutual friends. He said... He said, Doc, I had to read about my own injury in the paper to understand what I'd done to myself because he said even at the footy club, they, they couldn't be quite sure to explain. And so I said, I read your article. <laughs> I said, well, Shane, it's, it's something that, you know, it's an injury that people don't understand very well. So, so you know, those sort of aspects, sometimes the players would be, um, you know, they, they, they generally get a feel for it these days, but the public don't get given the correct information. Are there any, um, and I guess feel free to, to name a scenario if, if there's one that springs to mind, we obviously, you obviously discussed the fact that there was there was injuries where you could you know tell pretty reliably with years and decades of experience. Okay, that's a whatever. It's a shoulder, and it's going to be six to eight weeks, or it's going to be this, and it's going to be yeah. whatever. Are there any that stick out to you on the flip side where you're like I got that, I completely misread that, I completely underestimated that? Like, are there any that kind of really stick out that oh, okay, because you know it's natural, of course, you know mistakes yeah, can happen on, on both sides of the fence. Are there yeah. any that really stick out? No one's one hundred percent you know, prediction right sort of thing. I mean, it, it um, look, fortunately, there weren't too many, um, to be honest. I mean, I remember that, again, Wayne Carey um, had a really bad ankle sprain and um, it went one side, then the other side. So that double sprain, both sides of the ankle, um, medial and lateral ligaments to give them their proper names, Paul. And, um, and I saw him in the rooms afterwards because part of my great job that I had in this Triple M role wasn't just talking about who'd got a sore hamstring or that I used to go down the rooms and interview the best player or the it's coach. Really, yeah. the losing room. So I was really behind the scenes and, and I really got to know the player managers and the coaches and all the players knew me by name. But anyway, so I, I could see the size of Wayne Carey's ankle and he was hardly putting any weight on it. So I think I did a story on the Sunday footy show the next day to say that, you know, it was likely that he was going to miss between four and six weeks. And... Um, and in fact, I might have even done the Herald Sun article about it. But then the physios from the club cut that out. They stuck it up at the footy club rooms and said to Wayne Carey, right, Doc Larkins reckons you're going to make four to six weeks. We're going to have you back in three. And so and he played week three. And they always joked at me saying, you know, you know, that really motivated him because because that injury should have taken that amount of time. So that was a, a funny one with, with Wayne where they used that as a motive. They used my prediction of how long as it a was going to make him come back as a carrot to make him come back a lot more quickly. Um, but uh, look, no, they're not. There aren't too many. I mean, uh, you know, sometimes I, I would, um, you know, the time frame might have been slightly out. But it was a really, there's a lot of pressure because you know, one of the one of the reasons that Eddie got me into that job originally, and then I did it, of course, for the TV as well as, you know, that they were wanting me to sort of, as a player, limps off the ground. They were basically wanting me to know what the diagnosis was you know, what scan he was going to have, who he was going to see and when he was going to play again. Now, it only happened 30 seconds ago. Like the club yeah. hadn't assessed him at that time. So I'm thinking, fair go here. So, But once, you know, once the player came off, as long as I could, A, two things that really helped me with my job, Paul, one was a replay of the incident so I could actually see which way the body twisted or which way the ankle or the shoulder had gone. Yeah. And I had the advantage of certainly when I was doing the TV broadcasting that I'd have a monitor to be able to do that long before the clubs had the laptops down on the sidelines like they have to now, where the, you see them, the doctors checking the incident. Monitoring all the time, yeah. Particularly it's a head injury, but even a knee or an ankle. But I had that. And secondly, once they came off the ground, and and, you, and these days, I think I changed it a little bit, I'm told by the clubs anyway, um, these days they take them down rooms out, out of sight. So you see them going down, you know, under, underneath so the TV cameras can't see them or that. But generally in those days when I started the, the first 10 years, the doctors would be examining your knee on the sidelines or your hamstring or your shoulder. So I, I knew from my experience as a doctor the difference between an AC joint and a collarbone and a dislocated shoulder. So, you know, whilst everyone knew it was a shoulder that they were checking, I'd be able to say which particular part of the shoulder because different parts – of those injuries result in, you know, some you can go back on the time, some you can strap up, some you're not going to play the rest of the day. So so the immediacy of having to make a decision as to what the injury was and how likely it's likely to be out there was something that I sort of, I sort of, I guess I sort of prided myself on on getting that right 80% of the time. And uh, I mean, 80% of the time is a, a pretty extraordinary strike rate, right? So um, yeah. I must say, again, as someone who's purely consuming the footy at this point and, and would you know listen to any sort of piece of feedback that would come in about my beloved cats 
I'd always t- uh, put a lot of weight in the things that you would say, and it was it, it was really valuable when it comes to those meta things like the the super coaches and those sort of things. But also just you know, as as a fan that wants to see my team go well, to yeah. to have the feedback come from you, okay, I I can take that to the bank as much as you can ever take these sort of things because there is a human variable to the whole thing. Um, yeah. So I mean, look, when I started, you know, I mean, Dipper Paul, you know, Dipper Dominico was was yeah. doing the um, Channel Nine um, broadcasting as the you know the, the sideline commentator, and I and I was there with Triple M. There were no other radio stations. By the time I finished, I'd look there. There was SEN on my left. There was ABC. There was Indigenous Radio. There was of course Three AW. So K Rock. You know, so suddenly I had like eight teammates, they're all with microphones, all trying to listen in. But I was the only one with a medical background who'd, one, been off the background of a sporting career myself. Secondly, I had a, a medical career and I had an AFL medical career and I had media experience. So media training that, as well. Yeah, so that, that sort of combination, I guess, gave me a little bit more of a, a heads up about what was happening, you know. But um, And these days, because I'm not doing that job anymore, I, I, I just do freelance stuff and, and work in a slightly different clinical field, still work in the medical world. Um, I listen to the other sideline broadcasters having a guess or making a comment. And, you know, and sometimes if I've seen the incident, it's really frustrating for me sitting at home on a Saturday night with a, you know, a pizza and a glass of red and I'm watching the cats play and, <laughs> and then the commentator won't name names to protect the guilty Paul. But, um, you know, they make a comment about it's a, it's a, a lower leg injury or it's a, a shoulder injury when it's actually their elbow or their wrist, you know, and I can see the difference from my training days, but, but that's the difference. They're not expected to, to know that they don't have the eye for it because they don't do it as a career or as a job. So it, it's, um, it's, it's funny watching it now. Um, and as I said, quite often now the player will go straight down the race. And so you don't get to see. They try to obscure it. Yeah. The clubs have gone A from the TV. Um, and every now and again, you will get that little capture because the CCTV exists. You, know, you see them as they're walking through yeah, the room. Yeah. In, yeah. You see the player grabbing the back of the hamstring on, as he walks in or he's pointing to the thing. And that, that was the thing. You know, my When I did work those games, I had to be watching all the body language because I wasn't there to watch the footy. I was there to watch the injuries. And so whilst the big contest would happen over there and there'd be a big crash of players and the ball would go down, the ball would head off. And, of course, the commentators are talking about where the ball's gone. I'm watching behind the player to see who gets behind? it who's getting up slowly, who, who's a bit staggery or who's grabbing the shoulder because that'll give me an insight to watch them for the next few minutes to see if that amounted to something. So quite often you just got that five or ten second glimpse um, of which part of the body w- w- the injury occurred um, and especially when the players come off because, you know, body language is a big thing and lip reading and body language were the two things that got me through a lot of that stuff that I was doing. Brilliant work with the little behind the play plug in there along the way too. Really, really appreciate dropping that name there too. Um, so, I guess you you spoke about yourself there. You've you've kind of moved away from the from the scene a little bit there. We will see, uh, as you say, you kind of work in a bit of a freelance capacity. We see on social media, even whether it's tweets or whatever, from time to time, commentary around around different injuries that surface. Um, I guess what is this period post that direct ongoing involvement with the AFL been like for you and um, I guess even on that day to day and totally personal level, when do I when do I need to say my piece? When do I need to just yeah yeah I've, I've got to pull myself back a little bit because you know one of the advantages of being at the games and seeing things unfold live is you have a much better feel for before you make a comment or or, or have a guess or you know an estimate of what the injury is. But um, so just backing off a little bit again, I, I'm still working at, at Epworth Sports Medicine, so I'm the director of sports medicine there. I'm working most days of the week seeing people with a sore knee and a sore shoulder. I'm not seeing the footy players, but I'm seeing the people that just want to play golf or walk their dog or be active. So, so my sort of background in that orthopedic and sports medicine um, area is still very active in, in day-to-day practice. Uh, plus, I've also got a, a corporate business where I, I look at the value of healthy living and, and looking at the way exercise. So all the things we learn as an athlete, sleep, nutrition, training, recovery, the things we talked about before, and we talk about high performance in sport. I, I've also got a business where I um, educate people on how to be high performance in life, you yeah. know, make sure that you look after yourself, your mental health, your physical health, your spiritual health. So I've got two medical fields that I'm still working on. But but to answer the question about the footy, it's really challenging now because I tend to not go to a lot of live footy, but I watch it on TV. But you only see what the TV shows. You don't see behind the scenes. You don't see what happens on the sidelines. So um, so I still occasionally put out a, a little bit of a, a tweet on the Saturday night footy if there's something happens, particularly if I'm 
have a different agreement from the uh, or a different opinion from the broadcasters that they might have put out, you know, because they might be saying, you know, as I said, they might say it's a lower leg injury and I, I can see that it's a thigh or a quad or a hamstring from my interpretation of it. So I'll, I'll often just make a little comment. No, I won't criticise the board, I'll just say, oh, look, Paul James looks like he might be finished for the night. It looks like a, a reasonably high-level um, hamstring strain. And, um, and, you know, and then half an hour later or so when you're not back on the ground it sort of evolves that way so but i'm pretty cautious that i don't because it's a lot harder when you're not there so the advantage i had was being live at the game as i said seeing the sideline examination um seeing the players reaction whereas when i'm watching it you know on uh, on fox footy or with the, the broadcaster they really follow the game they don't follow yeah. the injury player they might briefly you know, give you a side shot where they go back to the bench and they'll see, you know, the doctor having a look at Jeremy, Jeremy Cameron's, you know, hamstring. But it's like an instantaneous shot or sometimes the trainers will be standing there blocking the view of the camera deliberately. They do that so that the cameras can't see. So so I, I'm, I, I'm put out far less information these days than I did back in the days when I was working there, Paul, for reasons of accuracy. Yeah. Um, I never used to guess, right? So there were one of the things in that job that I had you know, because often the producer would be in your ear saying, you know, because I say, look, I didn't really see. I mean, he's gone down the race. Well, just have a guess. What do you think it is? And I have to say to the producers, you know, I don't guess. You know, I, my reputation is based on accuracy. Yeah. I, don't, I don't guess. I'm not going to guess whether he's got a calf injury or a knee injury, you know, because that that's I never did that. Let, let the other broadcasters guess, you know, I used to say to them. So that's why I've got to be careful when I'm doing tweets now that if I, if, if I can see a clear vision of it and they do nice replays. And I think, you know, the, there's so many different cameras at the ground now, Paul, as you know, and the angles that they show. And if they've got time... We'll see the picture-in-picture picture thing while the game is yeah, still continuing. Yeah, you see that little picture-in-picture picture shot as well. You play a limping off, you know, and they're carrying them off and they've got that in the corner while the, the game's going on. So if I can see, you know, a reasonable sort of view of what I think's going on, I'll often have a bit of a crack these days still. I can't help myself at... at, at <laughs> predicting you know how bad it looks not you know most people can see whether it's an ankle or a knee i'm not but not trying to be that clever but but if i've got a view of what happens i can tell whether it's a medial ligament or if it's a patella kneecap injury or whether it's a an acl mechanism so that's the fine tuning of the part of the that i used to do in the day i look i certainly appreciate your point about guesswork especially given um you know your employment status in the first place the whole thing was around the accuracy and the expert knowledge and that sort of thing and as soon as as soon as and it's it's interesting that i guess producers weren't necessarily always conscious or mindful of that and like you're brought in for that reason and as soon as you start yeah. guessing and you start to make errors yeah then well, what then am i here for that the goes, impact diminishes yeah. your credibility goes um you know a, i prided myself on being accurate secondly my medical colleagues used to listen to me and they'd watch and you know and, and even though they may not have been sports medicine colleagues um they knew my accuracy was there and so if i was having a guess you know and make getting it wrong then bound to be one of them on monday would would you know pull me up in Question the tea room at work and go you know how can you say paul james had a hamstring everyone can see that was his quad you know so i never used to have it you know so i again it was i was conscious that that, you know, I needed to be accurate. That's what I was getting paid for. And generally I was. And as I said, I was there to educate. So every time, you know, when I wasn't talking to my medical colleagues when I'm on the air, I was talking to the parents and the coaches and the kids. So when I tried to explain, you know, about a broken collarbone or, or about a, a hamstring and, and what treatment or how long they take, as, as, as much as you've got a very short amount of time when you're live anyway, yeah. to me it, it was all teaching. I was really teaching because... I realised that, you know, uh, particularly as we've got more and more into the, the concussion and head injury stuff, it was a really big forum for me to be able to make it very, very clear that we had to be respectful of head injuries at the suburban and underage and school footy and those sort of things because, you know, what you see, you know, happening on the on the TV, on the national, that, that that's that's really mimicked. It filters down. It filters down. And so I, I, my chance to have an audience, if you like, Paul, you know, of... A national audience you know sometimes we had a million people watching the finals on tv you know so i you know when i was but you know just even on a normal broadcast day there'd be several hundred thousand people that you're speaking to you never used to think about it but i you know i was always speaking in layman's terms dumbing it down because i wanted people to understand when i'm explaining the injuries because um they might be a trainer from a footy club or a parent who's just coaching his under 15 girls soccer team you know so it was important that i was hopefully putting out health messages as well during that time when i was broadcasting um, and so, obviously, you just touched on head knocks and concussions and the yeah. like, and that's obviously becoming a really... Because it's like an hour topic if we go... I didn't want to go into it too soon, but it's it's a big dilemma for, for sport worldwide at the moment, isn't it? 
Yeah, so how, how do we, I guess, and this this could end up being an hour-long thing, so I'll, I'll you know cut it off whenever you see fit in that regard. But um, I guess what what is what still needs to be done, I guess? Yeah, look, I mean, of all the time, look, I, 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 we've talked about my experience, you know, and hamstrings and knees, and no one dies from those, right? But but I've never been in an era of, of medical coverage of sport where I think we've got the, a challenge like we've got with the concussion, and I'll put mental health in that same sentence, Paul, because there is obviously a link between brain injury yeah. or brain misfunction, if you like, and dysfunction and, and what we're seeing, and whether there's a, a direct cause relationship between concussion and mental health, I'll come back to that, but... But at the moment, we're, we're really at the bottom end of the steep learning curve. We've seen enormous changes in the way concussion is managed on the day in a competition. And I'll use AFL as an example, seeing we're talking at a footy show. So in the days when I was working at the Crows, and, and we look back even in the, in the 2000s, right up to 2012, 2011, 2012, if you got knocked out, you're expected to suck it up and go back on the ground. And, you know, and, 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 and there was no suggestion that you'll be excluded from the rest of the game it was not considered to be a significant injury by the medical world uh, and by the neuroscientists and it really was only in that 2010 period of time when i went to a conference at the olympic uh, the winter olympics in vancouver that they had a massive big um, session that i sat in on at the medical conference there at the, at the olympic games paul about how concussion was suddenly becoming a big issue in american football and in ice hockey and they, how they were bringing in a rule to exclude the player on the day if they got concussed. And I thought, this will never get up in the AFL because the AFL, you know, the tradition was that you had to be macho. And, you know, when you think of the Jordan Lewis, you think of Tommy Harley getting knocked out in that 08. You know, when we, yeah. we, we should have won seven, eight and nine as plagues just to come back to the Cats, right? Because But Tommy Absolutely. Harley completely got knocked into the next suburb. And, and he had no idea what he was doing. And yet he was back on the ground again. And But he can't remember that part. So that was contemporary knowledge. Uh, and now we're in an era where we're having players who are suing. We've got litigation. We've got class actions. I won't talk about individual cases, no, of no, course. Please, yeah. But we've got an issue, really, where we're now finding that there are some long-term consequences associated with maybe just one single concussion. You don't have to get many concussions to have troubles because there's been many players who have had really one bad one and never recovered properly. And then you've got other players who have had 10, 15, 12 and keep coming back to play. And I think, goodness, why are they? Because they become their threshold to get concussed gets less and less each time and they take longer to recover. And so I think this whole responsibility that sports have got and the coaches have got and even the parents of the players have got and the player themselves have got to have some insight because we now have a big challenge of saying how many concussion, concussions are too many? We don't know. What what are the long-term effects? You know, we're talking about depression and anxiety and anger and mental health issues, um, suicide, gambling, and domestic violence. I mean, all these things have been linked to ex-sports people, particularly in the US, who are blaming their concussions on now their their mental behaviour. And of course, we've had suicides again uh, associated. And now we've got this, yeah. this condition called CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. In other words, brain degeneration associated with trauma to the brain, which is being very strongly linked with sports trauma, not, not just other trauma. And so now we've got this incredible challenge of saying, how do we make the game safe? Because we're talking about how to treat concussion better but i'm saying well it's too late you've actually been concussed we should be looking at how do we prevent concussion and we're in a game which is full of collision and high velocity a 360 degree game so i think there's a bit of a challenge going on for sports not 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 just not afl just AFL. no but you know horse racing with the jockeys with 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 um with soccer with nfl with ice hockey because it's a collision it's a violent game players go into it voluntarily knowing they might hurt a hamstring knowing they might hurt a knee so now do we have to sign a waiver that you might hurt your brain so i don't know because you know you can't completely eradicate head knocks and i'll go back to the the cats gary rowan and, and jezza cameron Jeremy cameron yeah i mean there are two teammates now if, if, if gary rowan i can't remember who we were playing that day i was at the game but let's say it was if it was a Melbourne player that had done that to Cameron, he would have got six weeks for that because it was an accident. So you can you can hit heads accidentally. A training a teammate can do it. So we're not going to eradicate head knocks. What we have to understand is players are taking they, they've been getting coming back too quickly, and we don't. You know, yet it was have, Melbourne, by the way. It was Melbourne, by the way. Yeah, I, I nice thought it, that's right. Thank you for helping me out because I did say, but but you know that was a teammate versus teammate. Yet I bet you that would have been all over the papers and there would have been a fight and a scuffle afterwards if Rowan had been in a Melbourne jumper. He would have been accused of being, you know, and here, you know, so the issue... And you, I'm, you did see that sentiment get echoed on the internet, you know, at least at least on the internet, you know, as I'd sk skim through and see what people are saying about these things. You, yeah. you would see that comment from time to time. You say, well, 
if this was an opposition player, there would yeah. be a consequence. Yeah. And a I pretty mean, severe yeah. one at that. Yeah. I mean, you look at, you look at, and again, I sort of wouldn't mention cases, but you look at Angus Brayshaw with Maynard, you know, in that, in that incident where, where Brayshaw got completely, you know, cleaned up in the first quarter in what was a genuine challenge in a contest. But of course, it was a challenge that was a dangerous challenge with what, what he did. And it's now going to be ruled out that you can't do that. And Maynard didn't go out there to knock. Brayshaw yeah, there's out. There's no but, malice to it, of course. But my, my example that I'm using there is that players that have had multiple concussions, you know, and, and whether it's Paddy McCartan or whether it's whether it's Angus or, or whether it's um, Liam Picken at the Bulldogs, you know, these players, some of them have had to retire. Um, you know, so we, we've got a real concern about a crop of players who have had lots of concussions who are wanting to come back and still continue their career. And we're saying, well, is it safe to do so? And no one's got that answer. So what, what I'm really fluffing around here is we don't have all the answers as to why some people recover better from concussions than others. And so the dilemma that sports have got, all those sports I mentioned, not just AFL, is how do they make the rules, which they are doing. The AFL listens to every rule suggestion, you know, the sliding rule, the head over the ball, the sling tackle, the spear tackle. Every time they get pointed out a dangerous part of the game, they introduce that. So people say, oh, the AFL's not doing enough about concussion. Well, what do you want them to do? I mean, you know, do we... And there's now discussion about not not allowing you know full tackling in training and the number of things you're allowed to do, like they do in certain sports overseas. So we're changing the fabric of the game to make it safer for the players, but we're a long way away from getting all the answers right, Paul. Absolutely, yeah. There's still so much research that needs to be done in the space to ensure that the players are supported, that people are educated. Um, there's a lot of yeah. road still ahead of us. Yeah, and and again, just to. There are far more concussions occurring in country football and suburban football and school football than are the AFL. So while we're talking about highlight cases and you know the you know the ones that make the papers, there's a lot more brains out there getting rattled around every weekend in sport that we have to be careful of because CTE doesn't just happen in AFL players or NFL football. CTE can be in in a in a anyway. guy a, tra a tradie who's playing up at Bensdale in a, in a month's time in a footy match and gets concussed and he gets it. So so we've got to look and see you know because. There's a threat, I suppose, to the sports in one sense because parents are looking at the safety of certain sports already and saying, "Do I want Jenny to play this sport, or do I want you know Jimmy to play this sport?" Because AFL versus soccer, or whatever it might happen to be. Yeah. So, so all the sports have got a public relations challenge, I think, going on there. But the head injury, mental health one, to me, it's at the top of the tree. Yes, we'd like to stop ACL injuries, and yes, we'd lo like to stop hamstring injuries, and we're doing training and conditioning for those but we how do we condition the brain so that when it gets smacked as hard as it does when it hits the surface at marvel stadium or gets kneed in the head um you know how do we stop the brain from rattling we haven't got that there's not not any mechanism of preventing that at this stage even with the duty of care that comes from the opposition player having to be careful yeah it's it, there's a lot of yeah there's a lot of roads still ahead and hopefully hopefully at the end of the day we come to an outcome that is with the players safety at the forefront absolutely i mean just the, the whole you know the whole reputation of the game depends upon that and as i said when now we've got all these litigation cases which which i mean that's a pandora's box because we're talking about afl players and we've already had an nfl case that got settled we've got soccer players in the in the in europe that are coming up with the suing because of the way they were treated uh, and I'm not saying they haven't got genuine problems, Paul, but what I'm saying is where where does that end? Because what, what's to stop the suburban footballers who were badly who were put back on the ground because there wasn't good medical care there and now? What, what stopped them suing the, the East Gippsland League? Yeah. You know, so it's a real dilemma for the lawyers. It's not just a medical problem. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another thing, and I guess we are recording this in a bit in a bit of a vacuum as we touched on early on, but something that's kind of popped up in the in the news this week has been uh, player weights and those sorts of things, and kind of the the way that is or isn't documented. Now, I know it's not, I yeah. guess, quite the same realm, um, but I guess what what's your current stance on on what's transpired in that space? Oh. My current stance has been the stance I've had all the way along: is that there are certain responsibilities as a player regardless of what sport you're playing to you know to to meet certain requirements for fitness power to weight ratios they used to have skin folds in my day at school and when yep. i was working with crows and the cats it was skin folds and people say oh you know you're shaming people and it's you know it's it's an invasion of privacy well no it's not it's it's about having the players be educated um whether it's a female or a male player as to what their best physiology way to present themselves is and part of that is is knowing whether you, you're carrying weight because power to weight is is a, a an important thing in in a lot Absolutely. of sports. Um, um, and you know, 
most of the top athletes are not overweight, no matter what sport you look at. You look at the Olympics in July this year coming up in Paris, you're not going to see many fat ath athletes at the Olympics, I can tell you now. So um, so the lean body mass, as it's called, um, which, you know, so it's, it's important. To, it's not about shaming. I think it's just more important about allowing people to understand what their ideal weight is so again we've got to be careful we don't go to an extreme of saying everyone's got to be you know skin and bones because that's no. that's not in body mass that's unhealthy weight loss but I, unhealthy. I, I, I don't i don't have a problem with targets being set whether it's a skin fold measurement whether it's an ultrasound measurement of body fat or whether it's a weight situation but it's got to be done scientifically in, with the context of a sports scientist and a dietitian person giving you the correct advice as to what it should be. It's not just a, a rote formula that has to come through. So I guess to that point, and I guess this maybe builds upon your answer there, the the big, I guess, part of the topic this week has been the fact that this information has been public for the longest time, whether it's through the AFL Bibles and those sort of things, whether you can draw the information up online, wh whatever, whatever your resource might happen to be, and the fact that that's no longer going to be the case. Yeah. Is that a good thing or yeah. a bad thing? Because we're, we're seeing yeah. kind of mixed opinions. Yeah, on that sense, I mean, I think it doesn't need to be public, you're right. I mean, what I was making the point was that it, it, it should be part of the athlete's preparation goals and, and getting that information internally, at least, from the sports science and the nutrition people particularly. And the doctors tend to get a bit involved in that, but I'm more, more talking about the fitness and conditioning people and the nutrition people. So I don't think it needs to be on a, you know, on a, on a, public website that to know that you know peter larkins has got a body fat of 18 percent when he's supposed to have 15 percent i mean yeah um, but i think peter larkins as an athlete should be told what his targets should be and he shouldn't yeah, go of off shouldn't go off to vegas at the end of the season and come back 10 kilos heavier like the players used to do when i was working in the job they'd go to vegas big off go season to, go to bali and remember they'd go and now the players you know that they, they don't they don't come back you know twice the size that they were because it's too takes too long to get back into shape so they're more professional so i think having numbers and targets and weights and, and those sort of things is reasonable but yeah as you say having public accessible probably not because i mean w why does it need to be it's really designed to give the athlete the best preparation they can for their high performance goals i must say there's been there's no been no point in my consumption of football and even you know talking about it a little bit in the last couple of years where i've thought oh the the fact that such and such is 92 kilos is really at all relevant um to to a particular conversation you can kind of look at someone and go okay that's that's a bit you know tom hawkins is a, a giant hulking figure in the forward line we yeah. know that he can rag dolly's opponent we don't need to know that he's got a I don't know, and I'm just throwing numbers out here. Sorry, Tom, if you're watching. We don't need to know if he's, you know, five kilos heavier or X number of kilos lighter or whatever happens to be. It's irrelevant. You can you can eyeball these things often and and be able to render a not fully yeah. educated, but a somewhat educated judgment. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I again I've got a lot of most of my friends who are footy fans aren't medical and and everyone's got an eye when someone looks like they're carrying a, a couple of extra tubs of Hagendas on them, you know, after the end. <laughs> summer season right so so i don't think you know you need to have the weight printed in the footy record you can say oh yeah he's, he's looking he's You're carrying looking. a bit more here yeah. well so i think you know as, as a sport fan you have an eye for it particularly if you know the player from serial over a few seasons and i'm not talking about the guys who put on some muscle because again we see guys bulk up so called and they're not they're not they're not having the um the, the jumper stretched over their guts you know like when we're yeah. saying these guys look a little bit in the their, their shorts have gone up two sizes, you know. I'm talking about the guys that have bulked up. And they're they're broadened shot. rather than rounded off. So that's that's the acceptable weight gain. And a guy, you know, a guy will go from 88 kilos at the end of 23 and he'll come back at 94 kilos. And it's not because he's got on the six kilos of fat. He's put on muscle in the gym and he's done his work. But the guys that are carrying weight wrongly, I think you generally have an eye for it. You can see up. in the way they're running. And, I, and again, I'm not mentioning names, but we've all seen them over the last decade. And you can see, so who doesn't look like he's in the shape he was last year? <laughs> well, it was only the other day where I saw Dane Swan putting out a tweet where it was the back page of the Herald Sun commenting. I think it was in 2010. Was that the year on the Brownlow? I think so. Um, that was talking about his weight and he then made sure, made sure to mention hey and i also won the brownlow that year too yeah um so yeah. It, it is one of it is one of those things where there's players that will buck trends there's things that might be obvious and, and, and players know I mean, he's an athlete certainly as a runner I, I i had an ideal weight range which was with when russell one one to two kilo it was that was the actual range that i had to work through and um certainly that um you, you know yourself and so i think if you really are motivated to perform well you shouldn't have somebody putting a whip out to tell you that you've got to shed two yeah. or three kilos uh so i guess 
because we're, we're kind of close to winding things down, just cycling things back to, I guess, a bit of a Geelong focus. And and obviously, as we've touched on, a, a giant Geelong fan from a very early age. So reflecting on 2007, and I know you're kind of in the media landscape at this point, but 7, 9, and 11, and even in more recent, um, more recent years, thinking about the 2022 Premiership, how did you reflect upon all of those? Because it obviously been such a drought leading up to that uh, that first one, and then this period of sustained success since. Yeah, what, oh, what's look, it been like to enjoy? You never get you never get sick of success. I'll say that. And, um, <laughs> it's been nice. and seven, nine, and eleven. Of course, I was working on the boundary line um, broadcasting for Triple M. So, so what what a joy, you know, to be there watching your team. I mean, oh seven, of course, you know, when we absolutely annihilated Port Adelaide, that was. And after 44 years and, you know, having been around the club, as I said, my dad, who is, who had passed on before then, my family, um, having known the old players, um, you know, having seen so many of them over time, because I'm a member of the past players and officials yes. group down along with that. They're very good the way they look after us if you've been connected to the club in that way. So I'd seen all the old, the Mark Gates and you know, the guys that had played in the 80s and the prelims that we lost and the grand finals that we lost. So 07 was just glorious in, in one sense. And I remember being at the ground the next day and, of course, the, the famous um, across across at the the, 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 the hotel afterwards where, where you went across, um, you know, where the players used to go and, and having that whole day's recovery. And, you know, people crying and Billy Brown was crying, you know, in the... In, in the yeah, it was the still race. the telecast, yeah. Yeah, and, and I was in the race waiting to come off. 09 was, of course, you know, again, a challenging one, um, and, and 11, um, because of the closeness of, of the games as well. Um, but, you know, frustrated in 08 because I thought we should have won 08. And, you know, we did, We you know, and Stewie Jew, I still don't speak to Stewie Jew when I see him because he should have come off the ground with that sore knee. Had they sent him up forward and he kicks three goals in, yeah. in the spot in the quarter and wins the game for, you know. Multitude of things that he did wrong that day. <laughs> So, you know, the highs and lows of being there and, you know, and, and, and I've got photos of myself interviewing Gary Ablett in 07 because I had my Triple M top, but I had my Geelong jumper underneath it. <laughs> so once the game was over, the, the Triple Whipped M off. came off and I had the Geelong jumper on underneath. And so here am I, I've got photos of me interviewing. So I, I really was, you know, I was the absolute fan nut, you know, when it when it came to it in that time. 2022, com- completely different, of course. Again, a, a victory that was predictable you know I, I i didn't really start shouting about it until the third quarter but a lot of my friends would at quarter time thought we'd won that so um you know put it away so that was again a, a payback i suppose a payback for the players i mean in the sense of 21 and 20 we should have really had a, had a win and i think and um, you could make the argument for that 16 17 18 period and 19 as well i mean there was prelim oh, prelim yeah, after prelim yeah, yeah. um the, the, kept the, kept bumping the, into the, richmond at the peak of their powers yeah. The great motivation, the motivation, and, and I was very privileged to go to a, um, a, a, um, a an event at the end of the 22-1 where um, there was a bit of a season analysis spoken about by some of the inner sanctum people and and to know how they'd motivated, use 22, you know, as a, as a motivation. Joel Selwood spoke at it, but I won't say who else spoke at it, but it was a very nice event to be at. Um, but they spoke about, you know, using 20 and 21 as a motivation into 22. Um, and so it was almost like no one was going to beat us in 22. And that's why it was disappointing, I suppose, in 23 for it to happen. But, you know, to be there in 7 and 9 and 11 and, you know, as a kid growing up and having to wait for 44 years from the from the 63 one, it was, um, yeah, it, it was um, it was pretty nice to be um, in the rooms and shouting around and down at the ground afterwards. And as I said, back at the Lord of the Isles pub, you know, which was famous for the Cats. Pretty satisfying once once the damn wall breaks, and then yeah, as, as we touched on before, it's been a nice twenty year block really um, of, yeah. of seeing well, a long team yeah. that's won far more than it's lost. More more so than a lot of other of my mates who belong to it, you know, support other teams. And let's hope twenty four yeah. with the group we've got, you know, and with um, people staying healthy, and you know, is that everyone's having a great preseason? Like every, all eighteen clubs say, they're having the best preseason ever, which is <laughs> but but you know, we've still got a great squad, and we have a way of you know, I think the motivation of last year and having you know Paddy Dangerfield still hanging in there and Tom and you know we've still got some and the players that are coming through you know the play the homes and Bruins of the world that have got extra time in their legs from 23 and 22 I think we'll we'll see the fruits of that if we if they stay healthy so I'll bring the medical hat on again there is the touch wood component yeah we've got to keep everyone healthy Tom's been very good at, at load management and looking after players so we didn't have a great 23 we had a few bad injuries and we missed people but hopefully that won't be the case Cam Guthrie coming back's a great bonus 
Oh, it's, it's going to be huge. It's going to be great to see Cam there. And I'm hoping the dreadlocks are back because I feel like he lost a little bit of his yeah. magical power when they disappeared. He was Samson, wasn't it? Shaving the head didn't work. Cam, so <laughs> didn't get, work get, for him at all. So yeah. get the locks back, Cam. I've seen some photos lately. He hasn't got the, hasn't got the locks back, unfortunately. So no, I, I did see them. Hope, yeah. hope, hopefully, hopefully no, we're Zach's, wrong about the Zach's, association. Zach's taken over with the hairstyle now. Of yeah. Um, and, and wears it pretty well, I might add. As we start to wind things down, um, You've obviously had this um, this amazing access over many years and have been able to see generations of Geelong players come through. In your eyes, who's the greatest cat of all time? Oh, I didn't want and to I do ask. say greatest, so I'm not necessarily talking best in, ter- in terms of on-field, non-field only. It can be the whole pe- – really whatever way you want to spin it. Let me, let me tell you who my favourite player was when I was a kid, first of all. Um, Johnny Sharrick was my favourite player. Now, I wasn't a left footer, but I tried to kick left foot when I could. So Johnny Sharrick, who's still around and still comes to pass players and does stuff. So I think Johnny Sharrick was one of the most graceful, you know, beautiful, come off, coming off hop forward, left foot, left foot, sweeping. I love watching him play. I love Mickey Turner. I just thought the dash and, and you know, especially when he was, um, you know, he used to play against Ricky Barham and they had the, you know, the great contest that the Barham versus Turner. Yes. But, you know, I, I, had, I had the privilege... Paul, both of working with Gary Ablett, watching Gary Ablett play, both of them, both of them. Um, And, you know, it's hard not to say the best player was Ablett, but I don't want to say which one now because they're both so good. But, um, you know, and and because, you know, I saw saw Carey play and I saw Lee Matthews play and, you know, and and they talk about Carey, they talk about Lee Matthews and they talk about Barassi and back to Ted Whitten, you know, if you want to say. But but in terms of this influence and, and sheer... Um, brilliance, Mark, Kick. I mean, Gary Ablett Senior probably. Look, most players, most players would would acknowledge that. So, in terms of the best Geelong player, then I couldn't put him. I, I put him ahead of Gary Junior, and I hope Gary Junior is not going to ring me up and say, you know, but because you know what 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 a heritage as a family for the and along with Nathan, of course, as well. But um, but I think Gary Senior was, you know, watching him. Watching him play and watching him not train because he was the most gifted person who didn't train and still came out and influenced the game. So it was amazing that he would perform the way he did. Well, uh, if you don't have an ablet on the phone yet, then you might have an ablet on the phone after this next question because it's sorry, a Gary. Yard. No, sorry, no, sorry, I'm back. sorry, I'm, I'm busy, Gary. <laughs> Breaking up. Sorry. Um, schoolyard pick. You're building a team, and you've got Gary Junior and Senior in front of you. You've got to choose. Which way are you going to go for a team that you are building? Oh, um, I'm going to go a senior. Different sort of question at the end of the day because of the roles yeah, and responsibilities. Yeah, I'm going to for his height and his versatility um, because I think I could throw I could throw Gary Senior around a few more positions that I could throw Gary Junior yep. around. Makes a lot yeah, of sense. I, I have Gary in the middle, you know, Gary Junior in the middle, and across you know the forward forty and forward thirty any time. But I reckon I could put. I reckon I could put Gary Senior up back, and he'd just he'd do a Luke Hodge Make it work. half back and work. Um, of the current group of players, uh, and I don't know if a certain other steeplechaser within the club gets a little bit of personal bias from me. I'm not too sure. We'll we'll see there. But uh, of of the current, I guess, list of players, who's and again, hopefully, no phone calls are coming your way after this. Who's the favourite? Who who do you just have that little bit of extra love for at the Cats? Oh, gee, I'd love for a lot of them, boys. So don't, don't, I mean, Tommy Stewart gets my vote at the moment because I just, the way, I like Tommy's brutal application, his leadership, his, you know, he backs himself, takes him on, you know, he's got a, he's got a bit of brute about him, you know, he's not, the, he's, not, he's, not, he's not the nice Tommy, he's, he's, he's got a bit of brute <laughs> about him, but I think his leadership and his ability. I mean, you mentioned Mark Lixar, so of course, he's a great 1,500-metre runner. So if you speak to Mark, he was actually a great 1,500-metre runner who ran a few steeplechases, but his dad was in the same Olympic team as me, by the way. Yeah, right. So, so Blitz, I, I've really got an affection for because of his – and he is Mr. Utility. When we talk about, you know, utility players, which is not a term that gets used very often in AFL in the last five or six years, he's the true utility player forward back rut you know you name it so mark mark's been in a sanding crossover and and used his athleticism you know to, to his ability through that so i think tommy stewart along along with 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 mark uh, you know in in that sense i mean joel to me i know he's not the current list so i, I understood your question but joel was just the complete leader 
I mean, yeah, I mean, my son's favourite player was Joel, and, and, and just because you talk about ex leading by example and and make you know when Joel was just the guy that get that one clearance when we just needed it at the ten minute mark of the last quarter when we were six points down, and you'd go in the middle and he'd get the clearance, and so from a reliability point of view and and setting the example, and, and of course it didn't matter how bloody he got, he just put his head in there, and so. You know, his own safety didn't come into it. Now, I'm not advocating that you shouldn't. Not <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. a weird, weird that. spot for yeah, you there. But... So, so if I put Tommy Stewart up there now, and, I, and but you know, look, I'm I, I'm hoping Max Holmes develops into one of the great stars. I mean, I, I heard about him before I even saw him. I heard about his reputation um, from a very, very well connected Geelong person, and I thought oh, it sounds too good to be true. And I really think Holmes has got the ability to to also have a great career ahead of him at Geelong. Well, that that might answer my next one as well, which is. I guess the of the the next crop that are coming through, who is it you got the closest eye on? But I suspect it's Max Holmes. It is Max Holmes, yeah. And you know, I'm, I want to give a mention to Zach Guthrie because I think he got really he he, he really copped a lot of bad publicity when he first came. He was very talk about putting on weight for the right reasons, you know, building up, getting stronger, getting taller. I, I really admire the way Zach persisted because Cam got all the accolades and obviously was the star that he was. But but Zach came in, in and out of the team and he was un, undersized and took on some big games that he had to play against at halfback when he first came in. And so I really admire the way that Zach stuck to it and, um, you know, stayed on track and backed himself. And I'm really pleased to see him do as well as he did over the last um, couple of seasons. And the club backed him as well because when you get that, you know, external noise and things aren't quite working internally as well, yeah. you know, clubs can be prone to maybe pulling the pulling the lever a little bit, which is you know, well, thankfully yeah. something they didn't do with Zach. But especially with the social media being as active yeah. as it is, too, which the players can really get down if they're reading about that because that's the era that the players are in now when they're getting criticised. They they have to put up with that sort of stuff. Absolutely. It's, yeah, that's a, obviously a really, there's lots of great things to social media, but that's a really awful side. No, that, not a great thing. That, um, the people that, you know, because often you don't know what a player's going through off the field. You don't know some of the stresses that you know, it might be the mental health stress. They might be carrying an injury that, that um, you don't know about. And that's the reason they're not performing as well, but they get absolutely smashed and brutalized. And, and it, it's good to see them rise back up and, and hold their spot and be, you know, a, a, an immediate selection when they get to that selecting of the team. You see Zach's name goes in there, bang, if, as long as he's fit and available. And that's what I've really enjoyed about seeing him back in there. Yeah, he's a walk-up start and we love having him. It's been, it's been fantastic to see. Um, I guess looking the the other side of the game and something that's developing quite a lot in recent years, the, the AFLW, the women's game, how are you seeing things travelling in that space as well? And I guess specifically, even when it comes to the cats, what are you, what are you seeing there in terms of how things are um, how things are going? Yeah, I think it, as as a concept, obviously fantastic, and we've seen the teams come in and we we missed out. I remember talking to Brian Cook and we were trying to get our cats team in in the early days and we missed yes. out. And as people have come through, but look, it, it probably got ahead of itself in the early days in terms of the number of uh, people that were available to support the AFLW system, it, it probably launched a bit quicker than it should. I think, what are we up to, seven years now? Um, and um, there just wasn't yeah. infrastructure around around the medical, the physios, the performance, the assistance. And so these girls were coming in and being thrown into a brutal game in a very short season at the wrong time of the year on hard grounds without any pre-season coming from sports. And so, we, you know, and we didn't have the quality because they haven't grown up with a footy in their hands. So what we're seeing is this generational thing over the next five to ten years where the girls at three and four will grow up with a footy in their hand the same way the boys have done. But they'll also grow up understanding that it's a 360 game because what we've done, we've had so many brutal knee injuries and injuries coming through from some stars that have crossed over, Paul, from, from yeah. netball, from hockey, elite athletes. But they're not used to getting tackled. They're not used to the three direction or three sixty direction of the game, and and certainly the concept of of that um, body awareness. And so we've seen a huge spike, as you know, in in ACL, ACL. injuries in the knee in, in the women, much more so than men, and much more so than in other sports that women and men play together, like hockey, basketball, soccer. So the AFLW's had another level again, and it's because they haven't had the preseasons. They were playing on hard grounds at the start of the year. There are certain physiological things will never change with women, right? The strength is never going to be there. That, that there's a different shape to the girls' knees and pelvis, just to go back into the medical description for yeah. a bit. So there's always going to be a higher incidence of women's knee injuries in sport where men and women have played the same sport. But AFLW, so back to the statistics, five to six times the rate of knee injuries in, in women in soccer, women in basketball, women in hockey, women in um, other sports like volleyball compared to yeah, men. comparable ones, yeah. Suddenly AFLW comes along and it's eight to ten times higher. 
we're going, what what the heck's going on? And so we've looked at there's six or seven things, as I said, strength, the shape of the knee, um, the tackling, the grounds. But they don't have the pre-season. They were rushed in and rushed out, and they don't get the recovery. They don't have all that infrastructure behind them. So the more professionalism that comes into AFLW over time, um, I think we're getting there. But it's 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 still a slow burn. And, um, you know, we've got some absolute stars at Geelong, you know, we, but we, we need the depth. We talk about the top 22. You need your best – you need your 22nd. Run through to 30, player, yeah. Your 22nd and then 26th player. So with the women, there's been some absolute stars at top five or six. And then other girls that have come through there that have, haven't had the ability to – put in the conditioning or put in them because they're all teachers or they're all working in the bank or they, you know, you know, so they're not full time. And so the, the, the standard is gradually growing, particularly as I said, as the three and four and five year old girls now grow up playing grow their up. Kids and understand the nuances of footy. Yeah, it's going to be huge. And I think there's a very, very bright future ahead for the competition. And hopefully uh, the cats are a part of, part of that and pinching a few premierships along the way. It'd be a fantastic thing to see. And, and certainly the yeah. current squad looks pretty good. Well, they he, look he's good hoping. In, no, they look good. Yeah. Unlucky, I will say, uh, in the end. I won't, won't delve too much deeper into that, but unlucky. Peter, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show and to, to learn about your journey through this entire industry, but to discuss the athletics and, and some of those amazing experiences you've been a part of. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. If people, and we touched on social media and, and where people might see a tweet from time to time about the game, if people do want to see what you're up to or hear some of your thoughts, where should people go? Yeah, well, look, at Doc Larkins is my... My uh, X handle, as it's called, or Twitter handle. Oh, yeah, yeah, X. <laughs> when, I, when I do venture into talking about uh, a tennis injury at the moment with the tennis uh, just finishing up and uh, with the footy coming along and the cricket, I, I, I do that on that. But also um, I have an Instagram, which is uh, just Dr. Peter Larkins. And so that's the, the public or professional one that's, that's accessible to everybody. And then drpeterlarkins.com is a, is a website, which really is more my health website, talking to people about how to live healthy and and uh, the concept of healthy, you know, getting your your best out of yourself in high performance in life. So, um, so there's a few things there between the the at Doc Larkins and the uh, the Instagrams. So please, people, make sure to check all of those resources out. Um, as we said before, you've got the propensity to pop the occasional tweet out when you make an observation on injury. That's really f- uh, fascinating reading as well. There's so much there that people can learn from you. So please. I implore everyone who's watching and listening today to, to utilize this wonderful resource that um, has given an amazing amount of time to me today on the show too, by the way. So thank you very much for, for sticking around. Nice. Thanks, Jane, Paul. And let's, uh, let's have a good year for the Cats in 24. Go, boys. He's hoping. Uh, Cats fans, if you haven't already done so, please make sure to subscribe to the Hoops Crew on YouTube, follow Behind the Play on podcast feeds to catch up with. We've, we've got some of the AFLW girls coming on board. We've got AFL men's players coming on board. We've got a range of amazing people from throughout the AFL industry and specifically the, the Geelong scene coming on board. So please make sure to check all that out over the course of 2024. Again, Peter, thank you very much for coming on the show. Cats fans, remain Geelong strong, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.